whenever using a Ruby gem, it's a good idea to take a look at the source code to get a better understanding of how it works under the hood. This can really help when debugging problems that you run across, or you might want to contribute to the gem. Also, reading other people's source code is one of the best ways to improve your own, and you'll likely learn a few cool tricks along the way. In this episode, we'll be diving into the Rails source code to get a better understanding of how controllers work and how they handle requests. I'll be using this example article's controller to help drive our exploring. So let's first find the related source code with this. As with most controllers, this one inherits from application controller, which in turn inherits from action controller base, which is defined in Rails. So let's grab that repository. I'll run git clone at this repository, which is hosted on GitHub, and then cd into there. Now this is the master branch, which is currently the upcoming Rails 4 release, but I want to browse through the version that I'm using in my example. So I'm going to uh, check out the version 3.2.9, which uh, is tagged in the Rails repository, so we can easily browse through that. And I'm also going to open the action pack lib directory, which is where all the controller related code is. So in here, we can find the class that we're inheriting from, Action Controller Base. And this class inherits from another class, Action Controller Metal, which is defined in this file, which this class inherits from yet another class called Abstract Controller Base, which is defined up here. So these three classes are what we're going to primarily be focusing on in this episode. However, those three files don't contain all of the methods that we have available to us on the articles controller. If we call ancestors on this, and actually let me uh, print this out, we can see that there are a lot of modules which are being included into our controller which have a lot of methods defined in them. You can see that if I subtract from this the articles controller uh, included modules, then that is going to give us basically our inheritance chain showing us the uh, action controller base metal and abstract controller base classes that we're using inheriting from in our articles controller. Now that we've located the relevant source code, let's walk through what happens when our Rails application receives a request. First of all, when a request comes in, it's going to go through this list of rack middleware before it even hits our controller. Now I did a code walkthrough of this middleware in episode 319. After that, it's going to be handed off to our application's routes, which I also did a walkthrough in episode 231 and 232. Now the routing behavior in Rails is handled by action dispatch. And this, if you take a look at the route set class, uh, the dispatch method in here is where the routing will hand it off to the appropriate controller action. And it does this by calling the controller action method, passing in the action name, and calling call on this because it's a rack application. So back in our example application, if we call the articles controller action method, and let's say for the index action, this is going to return a proc object which uh, will act as a rack application and allow us to process the request through it. Now let's see where this behavior is defined. We can grab that method called action and call a source location on this, and we can see that's under uh, action controller metal on line 244. So here is that action method, and looks like it also takes a second argument allowing you to customize which class is used to represent the request. Pretty cool. So the first thing this does is call middlewarestack.build, passing the action name and the uh, block to it. And let's see what that does. It's defined up near the top of this file. So what this will do is loop through all the middlewares defined on this controller, check if they apply to this action, and then build our uh, rack app through it. So this means that each controller has its own little mini middleware stack that we can apply to a given action, and this is completely separate from the middleware stack that applies to our entire application. This is something I never realized until I was browsing the source code. The middleware stack is empty by default, but you can easily apply it by just calling use in your controller, and then let's say for demonstration purposes, let's use the show exceptions rack middleware. And let's only apply this to the show action. So now if I try to visit a record which doesn't exist, then that's going to be handled by the rack show exceptions middleware instead of the Rails one. And if I try to do this same thing on the edit action, that's going to use the Rails one because the middleware only applies to that specific action. This is really cool, and I suppose it could be used with maybe Rack SSL or some authentication or authorization middleware. Just whenever you need to add middleware to a specific set of actions, you can use this.
Okay, back to the Rails code. After it's done going through that middleware, it's going to make a new instance of our controller and then call dispatch on it, passing in the action name and an instance of the request which is generated by passing in the rack environment. So this dispatch method is defined up here. And this is going to store some details in instance variables, uh, process the action, and then call 2a on this, which is going to be the response. So it's either going to have a response object, which it then calls 2a on, or just returns the details like this, which is a rack response. Now, how does this process method work? Uh, this isn't defined in the action controller metal, but instead is under abstract controller base. So let's take a look at the process method. So this will remember the action name in an instance variable and then check to see if that action exists and otherwise raise an exception. So let's check what this method for action is doing. Uh, this checks to see if that action exists or if a method called action missing exists and then it does this handle action missing behavior which is right here, simply calling that method and passing in the action name. So this means, I believe, if you define this method in your controller, you can use that sort of as a method missing type behavior when you want it to handle any kind of action. That's kind of cool. I don't know how many valid use cases there are for it, but it's something I wasn't aware of until I was browsing the source code. So let's go back to that process method. So after we have a valid action, it's going to call process action, which is defined down here, and that in turn calls send action which is just going to alias to the send method. So that in Ruby is just going to call that method on the controller. All right, so back in our example app, we now know how this method in our controller is getting called, but that isn't the full story. There's a lot of additional behavior that Rails is mixing in through modules. Well, let's take another look at action controller base. This file primarily is including modules. You can see a whole list of modules here that are all included. This means all of our Rails controllers are inheriting all this additional behavior that is mixed in. Uh, some of these are mentioned in abstract controller, but most of them are within the action controller metal directory right here. Now let me walk you through what some of these modules do, starting with rack delegation. This is a smaller module, but it's very important. This is going to override the dispatch method that we saw earlier in the action controller metal class uh, to add a third argument for accepting a response object, and it's going to set that response to an instance variable here so it remembers it, and whenever we set the response body in our controller, this will uh, set that response uh, object. So if you check back at the metal class, you remember in this dispatch method, this has that to a response, and that checks the existence of the response object. So if it wasn't for that rack delegation module, the response would be a nil instead. By the way, notice this adder internal call up here. This works very similar to adder accessor, so it's going to create getter and setter methods for the response. However, it's going to use an instance variable with an underscore before it. Uh, this way it's sort of uh, representing an internal variable. Okay, back to our rack delegation. I also wanna point out that this delegates several methods such as setting the status, location, and so on to the response here. So this ties in nicely to the uh, redirect module, which I'll go to next. And this should be no surprise that it defines the redirect to method. So when you're calling redirect to in your controller action, this is going to set the status location and response body, which are all going to delegate to the response object thanks to rack delegation. And these uh, are all set based on this uh, little logic here, but I won't get into that. Okay, so we know what the redirect to method is doing now, but what about when you're calling render? You can find this method defined in the rendering module. Here it is, render, and there's not a whole lot going on here. Most of the logic is in the super call, so let's take a look at the super class, the abstract controller. This has its own rendering module. So let's look up that render method, and this is going to set the response body to the render to body method, which is defined here. And this does some processing of options and then calls render template. And this is going to delegate to the view render render method call. So the view render is, due, is defined up here. It instantiates a new action view render instance. So this is going to basically delegate all the rendering behavior to action view, which I'm not going to get into in this episode, but I'll likely cover it in a future walkthrough.
So now we know that calling redirect to or render uh, is just simply setting some details on the response object that gets returned from our rack application after the end of our controller action. But what about actions that don't have either one of those calls, such as these up here? How does it know to render the view? This is all handled by the implicit renderer. Uh, this overrides the send action method, which if you remember is defined in the abstract controller base class. And this will call default render unless we already have a response body. So this simply renders it without any arguments, which will render the current view matching the action. This also handles the behavior of rendering an action when no method is defined, only the template exists. Well, that's it for the modules that I'll be covering in this episode, but there are a whole lot more that I encourage you to explore on your own. Uh, most of them are pretty self-explanatory based on the name. Uh, there's cookies and flash behavior. Uh, conditional git adds some uh, caching capabilities with HTTP, and we have uh, the ability to hide actions, HTTP authentication. You got instrumentation, which helps us uh, trigger events for logging and such. And then you got rescue, which allows you to add custom behavior for specific exceptions which are raised. A responder, I believe, is actually a class which handles respond with and respond to methods. And you got your session behavior, a URL for, that could probably be an episode in itself, just how uh, it converts it to a URL string. And then don't forget the modules to find an abstract controller. For example, callbacks are used for the before and after uh, filters. And then you got your layout behavior and a whole lot more here. Well, that's it for this episode on Action Controller. I hope you have a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes when Rails is handling a request. Thanks for watching.